Howdy and welcome. I'm Mindy Jones with Pixis Care Management. Thank you for joining this conversation. In today's podcast, we'll be exploring challenges and opportunities surrounding our employer-sponsored healthcare system. For the last 12 years, the folks at Pixis Care have been successfully working with and for clients to determine their health and healthcare needs, find resources to address those needs, and help clients navigate the healthcare maze to make it all happen. In this episode, we are thrilled to discuss and explore with Ben Isger the challenges and opportunities employers are facing as they try to negotiate the healthcare landscape on behalf of their employee populations. Key takeaways include insights into the national healthcare system evolution, the employer's perspective on the current healthcare system, trends in the health benefit landscape, and innovative approaches to employer paid benefits. Speaking of employer paid benefits, let's address what employers are currently facing. Since the 1960s, healthcare costs have continued to outpace inflation to represent almost 20% of the national GDP. Interestingly, employers are the largest purchaser of healthcare services, more so even than the US government. As these costs have continued to escalate as a percentage of the cost of doing business, employers have tried to respond by changing insurance carriers or brokers, switching costs to employees, or cutting and limiting benefit programs. At the same time, employers are also dealing with the unprecedented labor shortage and have limited options to address the fierce competition for talent. A third constraint, especially as we are continuing our pandemic recovery, is the avalanche of need for mental health resources, not only for employees themselves, but also their loved ones. These three issues have put us in the perfect storm for a system meltdown which makes the dialogue today even more interesting, relevant, timely, and compelling. I'm very grateful to my friend, Ben Isger, Vice President, Healthcare Thought Leadership, Fidelity Health. So Ben, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Mindy. It's great to be here. So if you don't mind, would you give us just a a little bit of the history of healthcare delivery in the country? Well, first of all, I thought you covered the the major issues very well on, on the setup. I mean, I think there's a couple of things we can think about in terms of healthcare delivery in the, in the U.S. And what I like to focus on are what are the big changes that we've seen over the last couple of decades. Um, so we've seen this massive move towards consumerism in terms of how we deliver care. That was very different from a healthcare system in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s. That, that consumerism really didn't even start until the late 90s. So that's one issue. Um, thinking of people not just as patients, but um, as consumers and therefore needing a better experience like they get in other areas of their lives. I think the second thing we can think about is the what they call the digitization of the healthcare system. So mm-hmm. that's the same thing that a lot of you know industry sectors have gone through, which is you're moving from a paper-based system to a digital system. And that has a lot of follow-on effects in terms of efficiencies and the ability to transfer information. Um, and really, it also has a lot of follow-on effects to make it more consumer-friendly. I think the third thing that we think about in terms of massive change of how we deliver um, healthcare is really around the technology and innovation. And so we see things like cancer in some areas becoming more like a chronic disease. And that's, uh, we see diseases that were not treatable before now becoming treatable. And these are because of innovations in the pharmaceutical industry, medical devices, life sciences, um, and just how we deliver care, just having really better protocols in terms of knowing how to treat patients. So that's kind of the third big force, um, I would I would say. I think there's a fourth one that we probably shouldn't forget, and you alluded to that in your intro, which is around sustainability um, and the overall cost to the system. And, and that's one that's been uh, a challenge um, that doesn't seem to be going away. Um, and you know, there's a lot of global data out there about how the U.S. spends more per capita than many other countries, yet some of our outcomes aren't as good. Um, so there's still certainly some more work to be done there um, as part of our, our health system. Well, thinking about that per capita spend, how has that, you know, the delivery changed? The compensation has also changed from how healthcare used to be delivered, I would say, you know, pre-1960s. Who's been paying for it and how how does that relationship structured? Well, I think that the the biggest change, if you went back from the 60s till now and you kind of take it over the the, the last 40 or 50 years, is that we have moved to what I call a 50-50 system. This is kind of a rough 
a rough estimate of about 50% of healthcare in the United States is, is paid for by individuals and, and companies, so kind of the private sector, if you will. Um, and the remaining 50% is paid for by, by government. Um, and that also has been a change, a slow change over time. But as we've seen um, our system when it began, if you went to the 1950s or before, it was pretty much all paid for by, by individuals. Um, and then, you know, we had Medicare Act and, and Medicaid, and so we see more being paid for by government. If we fast forward to just a decade ago with the ACA being passed and the health insurance exchanges and the, um, the expansion of Medicaid, that's when we start to see almost this, you know, this 50-50 split. So we do have a hybrid system. Um, and in some cases, it's even kind of more complicated than that. If you look at something like the health insurance exchanges, those are private plans, but they're often subsidized by the federal government. If you look even at Medicaid, um, the delivery of Medicaid now often is, is done by private plans. So even within, after, you know, how the dollar is being spent is a hybrid between government and the private sector in the U.S. system. So what I'm hearing you say is pre-1960, you as a consumer would then negotiate directly with your doctor as to what are you buying, how are you paying for it, those kinds of things. Whereas now the the landscape is so much more complex with what services are being paid for and who's paying for them. And I know while we think about, oh, well, this is paid by the government, obviously those of us who pay taxes are also paying for that as well. So it's it's interesting to think about how many different ways this actually um, is mechanized. Mm -hmm. Well, I, oh yes, I mean it, it's there, there's a lot of flavors. It's it's Neapolitan, if you will. Um, so I think it gets you know I think as you dig into it, it gets even more complicated than that. I mean we have individuals that have insurance, which are st you know maybe through their employer, but they're still paying money you know out of pocket. We have people who sometimes choose not to use their insurance because they think they can find maybe a. Uh, you know, a better deal paying cash. Sure. Um, so there's really just a, a myriad of ways that um, healthcare is being paid for in the U.S. And you're absolutely right; it is complicated, and that is one of the challenges I think on for consumers in terms of how they're viewing what they even owe and, and how they need to pay. But it also makes it challenging because you then sometimes obfuscate transparency. Mm -hmm. And so then it, it becomes sometimes harder to create efficiencies if people don't really know who's paying what. Right. So um, I know that employers got involved in this. Um, I think it was right after World War II when it was, hey, we don't want to increase wages, so we're going to offer benefits in lieu of wages. I'm not sure how many people think of these things as benefits now versus entitlements, but how do employers feel about being in the mix of all of that? Well, I, you know, they are in the mix of all of that, right? And so from an, I think from an employer perspective, first of all, I would like to say, you know, look, there's a lot of different employer perspectives. It's not monolithic at all. But the majority of large employers in the United States, I mean, all, you know, the overwhelming majority of large employers are providing insurance to their employees. And so the question is, well, why are they doing that? Well, there's a, there's a tax reason for that, right? There's, you know, when you provide certain benefits, um, you know, those are not taxable as, as like your wages are. Um, so, you know, there's a tax reason, a financial reason. Um, there's recruitment and retention. And so I think employers have looked over time and seen it is a way to attract talent. And overwhelmingly, when you look at survey data of employees and consumers, I mean, they do look at benefits when they're thinking about jobs. And sure. um, so that's important to them. So you've got that recruitment retention aspect to it. I think also, and we certainly saw this during the pandemic, I mean, it is, you know, your, your employ, employer can sometimes be kind of like your family and who's going to take care of you, who's going to be there for you when things are tough. And so we see some employers wanting to get really involved in their employees' life, lives in a helpful manner of we want to keep you healthy, we want to reduce stress you know, in your life. And, and so benefits are, are, are one way to do that. So how do you, well, and this may be a more of a loaded question, but, but how do you describe the way employers are managing this complexity? I mean, whether they want to or not, I understand what you're saying about the monolithic or not monolithic landscape there, but um, how are they actually managing this? 
Well, it takes a lot of resources. And I think that's that's the challenge. You know, you, 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 we've seen over the years, sometimes, you know, you know, U.S. businesses will talk about, well, I don't really manufacture, you know, car, you know, my biggest expense isn't the manufacturing process. It's my it's my employees health. Sure. It's a big, big spend. And so when you talk about the word management, I think we need to start there. That this is the largest, you know, benefit spend they're going to have is in that that the healthcare mm-hmm. world. Um, so, so that's one aspect to it. I think the other is it does take a lot of resources, and so we see, you know, the the the, the HR leaders, the benefit leaders. I mean, they have teams of people to help do this, and often they're hiring, you know, consultants and other third parties to help them, you know, as well. But there's a wide continuum. And, and I would say as you move into the medium and smaller size employers, you see more and more they're going to have to rely on an insurer, you know, insurance carrier, a third party administrator, a benefit consultant, um, you know, again, a myriad of helpers to really guide them through that because they don't have the resources themselves. Mm-hmm. Now, it's the opposite when you get to the very, very large jumbo employers, they, they are the ones that have the resources sometimes to you know, have a lot of innovation, conduct, you know, conduct, you know, um, try to conduct new ideas in terms of benefits. And they have people that can look at the data and, you know, pilot different types of benefits and things like that. So um, definitely not monolithic, but they're all involved either through the financial tie-in, the, um, their own infrastructure, their own employees, their benefit leaders having to be very involved in this. Um, and then from that, they kind of fall along a continuum of a lot of innovation versus just trying to get it done. Yeah, no, I can um, completely get that. And I would imagine that the spectrum also ranges on how they're measuring ROI on those programs as well. Well, ROI is, you know, is, is always very interesting to employers with that spend. And there's a lot of different ways to go at that. Mm-hmm. So I think at the more sophisticated levels, when you're looking at ROI for any type of, you know, health benefits program, you're really looking at, you know, are we actually improving health? Or are we reducing cost? Those can be sometimes very hard to measure because it's very hard to pinpoint all the interdependencies that went into that change. Um, how can you prove it was, you know, just your health insurance or a standalone health benefit that, you know, that did that? Um, but, but that's kind of the gold standard. What did we actually, how did we move the needle on employee health and outcomes? How do we move the needle on cost efficiency? From there, you look at other kind of proxies of ROI. And so then you look at things like utilization, awareness, satisfaction. So what's interesting about we've seen in some of our research over the years that sometimes uh, employees are very satisfied with health benefits, even if they haven't used them. They just want to know that they're there. There's other type of benefits that when they use them, they have higher satisfaction. So that's kind of an interesting phenomenon as well. Sometimes just offering it is good enough. Yeah. And it's um, and interesting to see like when that five-star metric comes into play of, you know, how people are evaluating things and uh, versus how granular something can get from an objective number. So uh, I'm with you on that one. Your experience and research has looked at things in a, in a very universal perspective. What do you, we've been talking about the employer view what do you see that's coming up or trends on the from the healthcare provider side? Well, I think the health, I mean the healthcare providers look they are they are part of this you know this giant ecosystem and and they and they're living through those trends I was talking about the right. digitization of the system more consumerism so they're having to respond to all of those now over the last couple of years they've actually had a whole other thing to you know to deal with so you know the pandemic itself I mean they had a year, essentially, almost a year, where a lot of services were um, very, you know, very hard to access. They had, you know, challenges um, with, you know, keeping their own staff up and running because they're dealing with the, you know, the pandemic. Huge amounts of costs, huge amounts of learning were going on. But, but, by, but if you just if you step aside from that for a moment, again, they're going back to those main macro issues. They're dealing with affordability and limited resources. They're dealing with how can they create a better consumer experience for a very complicated system um, and create efficiencies there. 
um, you know, the, the story is not completely written yet with how technology is going to affect it all. In fact, every time we kind of get one technology figured out, like so all the things we can do on a smartphone with scheduling or getting your test results back, well, now we're faced with other areas of technology. So how is how are things like artificial intelligence going to play into things like reading you know, radiology uh, reports and things like that. So there's there's always going to be a technology question that the health system itself is going to have to, you know, deal with. Um, but a lot of times it's 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 positive. You know, that it is creating more efficiencies and things of that nature. Well, I know there's been a lot of headlines about non-traditional healthcare providers and new entrants and slash disruption mm -hmm. disruptors. Um, you know, names like Amazon and Walmart come right up to the, the forefront. What do you think about those entrants, those trends? Well, I, I think it's, I think it's, it, it, we shouldn't be surprised that new entrants are coming into the healthcare system because they see gaps and they see gaps in all the areas that we've been talking about. So if you're sitting there as a company and you're thinking to yourself, you know, my own employees are very frustrated by their experience boy, would it be great if they could, you know, schedule online? Well, a company is going to start that comes maybe more from the technology side mm -hmm. that's going to do that. And we've seen that. And so, you know, I think that the, the kind of the traditional healthcare system, um, you know, they know that there's gaps there and they have to make a decision on, are we going to change and fill some of those gaps or is someone from the outside going to, going to come in and, and fill those gaps? Perfect example we've seen over the years. So, you know, retail, uh, far, you know, retail pharmacies, um, getting into primary care, one on kind of every block in the United States. That happened obviously the last 10 or 15 years. But as a response to that, we saw more physician offices having weekend hours after, you know, after hours in the evening. Um, it's a response to, again, a new, what was once a new entrant coming in and saying, we, you know, we need to provide more, um, you know, just more hours for people to make it easier to sure. see us. I think you see the same thing on the technology side. You see the same thing on like the delivery side of how many things that we can get at home that are coming into the home. I think these are very natural reactions and, and, and they're going to be a part of our system going forward. Well, you mentioned just a minute ago as an employer looking at what do my employees need what other trends are you seeing in the benefit space that employers are starting to deploy? Well, I think the big one right now, and again, you mentioned it on your intro, is around mental health. Um, and so, you know, our, our research is showing upwards of, you know, 40% of, um, of employees and the surveys we're running are saying either they or someone in their household has a diagnosed mental health condition. That's a huge number. Huge numbers. Um and so em employers are feeling that and they're trying to deploy things to help with that. The challenge is we have this pretty severe mental health clinician shortage mm -hmm. in the United States. And I probably won't get the exact number right, but I think it's around eight, th we're short about 8,000 mental health professionals, according to the BLS, the, the, federal, um, the federal agency, the Bureau of, of Labor Statistics. So we have this, this big shortage in terms of the clinicians themselves. We have this incredible need. We've got a gap. Some of that gap is, is trying to be bridged by the use of technology. So we saw that big movement during the pandemic of moving from in-person visits to virtual health, telehealth visits. Sure. You can create some efficiencies over that, right? Because instead of having, you know, 10 visits in a day in person, and going from room to room, now a clinician can maybe have potentially 12 visits a day because it's virtual and so it's just a little bit more efficient. So we are so employers are looking at one of the big things are these standalone mental health benefits. So um, they're working with individual companies that that's focused just on mental health. They typically have a technology aspect of it, maybe an app. They might have a lot of educational materials on it that you may have the ability to text with a clinician. Of, of some sort. Um, you may have the ability to have a televisit or a virtual health visit from that, you know, from, again, from your smartphone. We even see things like digital therapeutics. So even FDA approved therapeutics that are run through your smartphone. So there's a lot of interesting things happening out there, but I would put that as probably issue number one on mm -hmm. employers' minds right now, which is how can we help our employees 
deal with some of these mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see around mm, direct primary care or dedicated provider access? I mean, you talk already about there being a, a, a shortage of providers on the mental health space, on the traditional physical health space. I know that's been a conversation for quite some time, um, both on nurses as well as physicians. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think there's a lot of things. I mean, there's a lot of innovation going on there. So, you know, one of the things that we see from, again, our surveys of employers is they're trying a lot of different things. So we've seen mm -hmm. renewed interest in things like on-site health clinics, near-site health clinics. So we want our employees to have as much direct access to primary care as possible. The other big interest that we've seen is what's being called virtual primary care. So same idea, but now you're doing it through a virtual visit or, or a televisit. And that could be done different ways as well. I mean, that could be where you have more of a relationship with a, with a single primary care physician or nurse practitioner virtually, or it could be more of a, a kind of a traditional virtual pro, you know, te telehealth visit where you might have a different provider each time you talk, but they have all of your information readily available. Again, we're still getting back to that same issue of having a relationship with a clinician, having access, having them help you with some navigation right. and, and guidance. So employers are looking at things like that as well. Um, they're really looking for anything that can connect the dots for um, employees. They know they lose a lot of time out there trying to navigate the system, especially with the handoffs between primary care, specialty care the handoffs between chronic disease management and something that's more acute, the handoffs between mental health conditions and other and chronic conditions as well. These are incredibly important to employers. Listen, the data is out there. You know, People with, with a chronic condition and a mental health condition are going to spend about three times more than someone with just a chronic condition in the right. health system. So there's a lot of interplay there. Part of that part of that solution is having primary care readily accessible for the employee. So with some of those innovative approaches you talked about, have they been around long enough to see any kind of success rates or? Well, I mean, I think some of them have been around for a really long time and they kind of come in and out of vogue, right? So like the, the company the doctor, the company doctor, the onsite mm -hmm. primary care clinic. So for some companies, they've had these for years because they may have an OSHA requirement to have, to have a, you know, a physician, um, on site, um, you know, others, uh, I think other companies saw this as an opportunity to provide an incredible amount of access and, and convenience. So yes, there's, you know, those are well tested, um, methods. They tend to be, you know, they tend to have, you know, high success rates in terms of employees like them because there's this easy access and you can, you tend to get some better, you know, care management that way. You know, I think the newer thing that we're seeing, of course, is the virtual primary care. Mm -hmm. I mean, virtual visits have been around, again, for a long time, but now we're trying to connect that up with a, a true primary care relationship, a true navigation relationship. So that's a little bit newer. Um, you know, I think there's some promising, you know, certainly anecdotally, there's some companies that have done that and they you know, think it's been very successful. Um, I think, you know, it's something certainly to watch and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of interest there as well. But there's look, there's a lot of other things, you know, happening out there in terms of, um, you know, more and more things, you know, being delivered as we call these point solutions. So mm -hmm. employers are starting to, you know, help their employees through if you have a, again, if you have like a chronic disease, a disease management being done through an individual point solution, a company that just specializes in diabetes management or GI management or COPD, what have you. Um, and there, and they've got clinicians available as well. A lot of times it is done, you know, virtually, um, some, you know, test kits can obviously be sent to the house, but these can be very nice ways to continue care in between that physical doctor visit, which sometimes can be only a couple of times a year. Right. Right. So you mentioned earlier about, um, benefits being an aid for recruiting and retention. And we talked also about how, there's this labor shortage. In fact, I think the jobs report that just came out was over 500,000 open jobs. So two open jobs per worker right now. Um, do you see ways that employers can leverage those benefit programs better for those goals? 
Oh, absolutely. So here, you know, here's the golden opportunity for employers. So and it goes back to what I was mentioning earlier, that sometimes you offer a benefit and just offering it is a positive for employees. Sometimes mm -hmm. when they use it, it makes it incredibly positive, but they have to know about it. And that's one of the challenges out there. There's a lot of, I would call, benefits being left on the table that employers, employees aren't taking advantage of. Here's a perfect example of that. We know that about 20% of employees through our surveys are saying, you know, we're not getting care and we're not getting prescriptions filled due to cost. The irony of that, these are people with insurance, by the way. Sure. The irony of that is sometimes that care was absolutely free. People didn't realize you get an annual exam every year for free. You get your immunizations typically for free. Many companies have Put to get put in free mental health visits, a certain number of free mental health visits to try to address the mental health issues. So you have employees on one side, on one hand, they're actually forgoing care because they think they can't necessarily afford it. And on the other hand, it may be there available to them for free. So there's a challenge there. And that and that challenge is how do you engage employees? They're working, you've got to communicate with them, you got to tell them about this benefit and explain it all. And frankly, most people don't pay attention until they really need it. Right. And so it's what the, the focus and the investment that, that we have seen and that we're really fo following uh, through our research is how can you, how can you have better engagement? How can you use the, the technology in the digital world to create nudges? Can you put, you know, reminders for people? Have you signed up for your annual exam? Do you know we have this? Can you put together benefit packages that connect the dots for people. When someone has a life event or they're faced with some sort of hurdle, it, it's not just telling them, well, you've got health insurance. It's also helping them to understand, well, you've got health insurance, but if you need to convalesce at home, we have a meal program where meals can be delivered to your house. Or we have, you know, a lot of times when you have a, you know, you get diagnosed with a chronic condition, you might have some questions um, and need some support on the mental health side. You know, we have that. It's about bringing all of that together to help the employee understand we're here to actually address your whole health and we're going to help connect the dots and not just leave you with a page of a list of benefits that you have to navigate through yourself. So there's great opportunities there for engagement. I think the opportunity side is, is obviously super positive, but I can also imagine just the messaging challenge of how to be warm and embracing of employees without being too patriarchal or invasive. And I think a lot of employers, at least the ones that we're talking to, get very concerned about overstepping that line. And so it's interesting to hear your take on that. Um, when you talk about employers messaging or making available a total health solution, um, how much do you see as being talked about from a more of a proactive approach versus a reactive approach. I mean, obviously we know that's where the expenses is on the reactive, but to your point, people don't always think ahead. So how, how are employers dealing with any of that? Or, or do you see that at all? Well, I think the, you know, the, from our research, you know, we, we, we try to look at what's happening on the innovation side mm -hmm. and, and for employers there, you know, the big focus is on risk stratification and, this, and by the way, this even gets to your point you were making earlier about what you know overstepping your bounds, not you know versus not overstepping your bounds. So first of all, a lot of employers they're not, you know, they're having a third party reach out for them, right? Sure. So they keep a firewall there between you know their employees' actual health condition and 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 you know kind of the advice they're giving. That's that's happening you know th from a third party. I think the other thing they have to you know you, you, they have to think about is. It's the shotgun approach um, is just not very effective. Of just we're going to throw everything out there, see what sticks on the wall, and and people can find that. And so if you if you use risk stratification, and that's you know obviously health health data shows that, and 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 you know the you know, people's carriers, their insurance companies help with that. But you know also we're seeing in, in innovative employers start to you know have surveys that kind of delve into a little bit of the social determinants. What is your access to nutritious food? What what are your transportation needs and issues? And this is where we're getting at the whole health, the whole the whole person. Yeah, we're putting their lives not just in the context of their workplace, but now we're putting their lives in the context of 
where they work, where they live, well, where they work, of course, but where they live, what their family situation is, what their transportation situation is. Are they caring for dependents of two different generations? They have an older parent they need to take care of and in younger kids they need to take care of. I mean, all of that context really matters. And once you have the context and once you can start to segment the employee population by risk, by needs, then all of a sudden the communication can be much more useful for employees and they're and they're actually getting what they need or when they raise their hand to say I need help that the communication is there that's connecting all the dots of you say you need help did you know we have x y and z that can that can help you right uh on this total health issue what do you think with respect to the provider shortage what do you think is a reasonable expectation of if we're able to raise individual awareness and employee employer awareness on health as a whole, on preventative as a whole, being aware of, you know, like you talk about the social determinants of health, et cetera. How much do you think we can deal with this shortage? Do you think that if we are a more engaged user that we currently have enough infrastructure, or do you still think there's going to be a shortage regardless? Of clinicians? Providers, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, listen, I've, you know, I've been doing this for a few years, and I would say that maybe just two, maybe just two. Yeah, right. um, there's always throughout my, my career in, in in research of the health industry, the health ecosystem, and what employers are doing. There's always been a shortage of one clinician or another. It it, it never goes away. There's always going to be some sort of constraint there, and so I think you know it, that actually is important for employers to know. <laughs> Because I think even when an employer says we're offering a new mental health benefit because we want to make sure you have more access, there are people who go through that list of trying to find a mental health provider and the first four names of the five they're given aren't taking new clients. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we do have to always manage expectations in the communication. Now, are there things that we can do to try to provide employees more access? Absolutely. And we've talked about some of those, right? So some of those standalone point solutions, they're really to do that. They're really to get people to have that access more quickly. Some of the things with technology, luckily, for example, with mental health, technology actually is sometimes the preferred method of interaction. So what we have seen is some of the biggest um, boosters of telehealth have been people that are having mental health visits. And the, the clinicians like it, the employees and the consumers like it, and it works very efficiently. We've seen data that shows there's a, a lower no-show rate for those visits, right. which is great. Um, so you know that, that, can be a, a, that can certainly be a help um, with some of the shortages. Ultimately, though, for what employers need to realize is that Issues of clinician shortages are a policy issue that have to be addressed by government. They have to be addressed by our university systems. They have to be addressed by our our clinician colleges. And we see that is happening in some places. We see more medical schools are opening up. We see more nursing programs that have expanded. We see things like um, state licensing requirements and having more intercompact licenses where someone licensed in one state can practice in another state. So when there is a natural disaster or there's just a population change, clinicians can move there and provide care right. and not be kind of locked out for regulatory reasons. So um, we, we see changes in terms of the types of care that different clinicians can provide. And so the expansion of advanced practice nurses, nurse practitioners, Mm -hmm. physician assistants, and what they can do, the expansion of the role of pharmacists and what they can do. So it's going to require all of those layers of things to happen to really move the needle on the clinician shortage. There's a lot of small things and important things that employers can do, but we all need to realize this is a societal issue as well. Gotcha. So... No, you have to share names. We'll protect the innocent. But in your research, in your travels, can you think of a company that's got it right, that's doing this the way they're supposed to be? Well, I mean, yeah, and I, 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 obviously I don't share names, although, you know, sometimes we'll feature feature companies in our, our, in our research from time to time. I mean, I, I try to look at trends and, and, and best practices. 
Um, I think there's a lot of companies that are that are that are doing things r- right, and I think a lot of companies, especially, rose to the occasion over the last few years. I mean, the pandemic was tough. The change to virtual work, in many ways, overnight for 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 companies that could do that. Right. Um, the 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 shortages, the 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 you know the cultural issues in the U.S., the political issues. I mean, there's a lot of like tension out there and economic tension and political tension. And, you know, there's a lot that's been happening. And a, and, and I would say a lot, look, there's a lot of examples of U.S. companies that have, have risen to the occasion. They've said, you know, we're here to help you. We're going to take on some of that responsibility. We're going to boost our benefits. We saw that happening, helping people set up to work virtually, um, you know, providing more health benefits, I mean, things like providing five free visits, you know, mental health visits or, you know, free visits for the year. I mean, those things are incredibly helpful for employees to take that financial, you know, kind of burden off the table. Sure. So there's certainly some, I would say, kind of more on the employer benefit policy level and the employer cultural level, culture level of a lot of great, you know, best practices. I think when you get into the weeds you see, all, you know, some innovation that's happening out there. I've mentioned a little bit of that. I think, you know, the risk stratification to go at, you know, and to provide very custom communication, very custom benefits to employee populations. You know, companies have done, some have done very well in that area, that use of technology. Some have done very, very well in that area. And even the b- blocking and tackling of things like plan design, just making sure that when you have, uh, when your insurance plan is set up, that it is affordable and makes sense for the employee population that you have and that there's access to the clinicians they need. So as we're coming to a close on our time, um, what else do you think employers need to know? Well, I think there's a couple of things that employers should be thinking about. Um, so w- I, we talked a bit about that engagement and, and mm-hmm. how and how employers need to have their employees engaged with their benefits, but otherwise really, they're leaving a lot of value on the table. So one thing is they need they need support and decision support tools are going to be are, are going to be very very important. Some employers are, are are enabling those. So at the point of signing up for benefits, um, I'll give you a great example. Some employers right now. It's all about, well, if you know, you've got four or five different plans to choose from, think about what you spent last year on prescription drugs, how many, you know, doctor's visits did you have, and fill that out in a worksheet and, you know, it'll help tell you which plan you need to be in. Well, if you think about that, most people are kind of like, well, I have no idea how many prescriptions I filled last year. So you're on the pathway for decision support, but have you really provided that decision, you know, support? And so we're seeing you know, more investments in technology around decision support tools that can go back and look at claims data, automatically fill that in for employees and say, this is what you did over the last couple of years, or this is what you did last year, and here's how that might sit with the plans you're looking at this year. So that's just a, a kind of a tiny example of what, of what we mean by decision support tools and something that em- employers need to be thinking about. The other thing is, I alluded to this as well as social determinants. I think the days of just thinking about their employees in the kind of the work box are over. You have to understand the context of their whole lives. Many employers are thinking about this anyway for their DEI strategies. They're thinking about this, um, you know, as a way, you know, for recruitment and retention, but thinking about people's whole lives in terms of building the workplace culture, in terms of making sure you've got the right benefits for them. Look, if you've, if you're providing all these benefits and people can't get to the doctor, it's because they don't have transportation, that's a big issue. So social determinants, incredibly important, um, you know, going forward. So that's the second thing I would say that in, in employers, you know, really need to be thinking about. And then last, I would just say, you know, the, 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 the kind of the future is not totally written with technology yet and what we're going to see there. And so um, the delivery of healthcare by the smartphone in the home, more of it being delivered in the home, um, diagnosis happening in the home, treatment happening in the home. Um, that's going to be an, another big play that I think em- employers need to be thinking about as they go forward. Yeah, I am totally with you on the frontier of healthcare. And for anybody who's uh, listening, who's got teenagers or college age kids at home, 
hi, we need more smart folks in healthcare. Please, please consider that for a career choice. I'll just plug that right now. Well, thank you so much for giving us some insight into this dynamic. Um, I appreciate the complexity and appreciate the sharing. I'd like to share a little bit now about our experience working with employers. One solution that we've been able to deliver at Pixis Care is that of a personal health nurse where we embed a dedicated health professional within the employee population. You can basically describe a personal health nurse as a hybrid of a nurse, coach, and resource finder for employees. They can spend their time helping employees manage chronic conditions, ensure that employees have the tools and support to get healthier, find community resources for non-employer paid programs and benefits, and support decision-making for employees with loved ones not on the health plan, like older parents. All these activities are focused on helping improve employee health, all while reducing healthcare costs and improving productivity. Just to give a bit more flavor, I'd like to read a success story written by one of our nurses in the field. My soul just got touched when a temporary employee came to see me and said, nurse, you saved my life. I don't think there's a price you can pay for that experience. I am so grateful for this work. He came to my office the week before last and asked for help. He doesn't have any money or health insurance. He was diagnosed with a disease that he knows is killing him and destroying his body. He reached out to Parkland for their assistance program, and they said a doctor could see him in nine months. He told me I will be dead by then. I referred him to a local charity clinic, filled out the paperwork for him, and told him what to bring to the appointment. He went to the clinic the next day, and they treated him like family. He said, they did everything for me. They took care of me. I have medications. The doctor checked on me. I'm going to get a free CT scan. I will be okay. This reminds me of why I became a nurse. I am thankful that he came to ask for help, even though he wasn't sure what to expect. And this is the impact that healthcare providers and access can bring to employees. In closing, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for our first episode of the Boundaries versus Bridges podcast, where we've discussed, explored, and learned more about the healthcare benefit landscape and what strategies employers are using. A special thank you again to Ben Isger, who shared insights with us on the employer perspective on the current healthcare system, trends in the health benefit landscape, innovative approaches to employer paid benefits. For another perspective on this universal and complex subject, please take a listen to Adam Grant's interview of Atul Grande on why everyone needs a health coach. Links to that interview and Pixis Care contact information and Fidelity contact information can be found in the notes section on YouTube and on the Pixis Care website at pixiscare.com. Huge thanks to Ben for sharing your knowledge and making this conversation possible. If you enjoyed this content, please like, share, and leave your comments. Thank you very much.